Thanks, thanks to everybody for coming out tonight. My name is Cliff Enico. Uh, I am a lawyer. I also have a syndicated column, which you can find out about. It's uh, succeedinginyourbusiness.com. That's the name of the column. Um, I also have a YouTube video with about 44, uh, 45 videos on it, specifically for people who are looking to start small business. Uh, this will shortly be one of them. Tonight's topic is a fun topic, and I really enjoy this. Uh, a lot of you here tonight are here because you're in a creative business. You're an artist, you're a musician, maybe a film writer. Uh, software developers, any software developers here? People doing computer type stuff? Okay, not much. Artists, can I, can I see a couple of hands? Okay. Uh, photographers, okay. Uh, writers, authors, that kind of thing. Okay, and there are a couple of people who are here for the free food, so that's fine. <laughs> that's always okay. I, I, I'm only kidding about that. But tonight we're going to be talking about, about an important topic. Um, every creative business is a business, and every business has certain rules that you need to follow in order to survive and grow. And creative businesses are no different than any others. In fact, creative businesses have uh, some very unique and specific challenges, which we're, uh, which we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, first of all, I apologize for this. Um, now you know I'm a lawyer. Uh, if you ever question that I was a lawyer, here we go. We always do the disclaimers before we do anything. You know, we tell you what we're not going to do before we do anything else. And there's two things here you got to know. First of all, uh, I'm here tonight as a guest of the SCORE organization. Uh, I am not, however, a SCORE counselor or in any way uh, officially affiliated with SCORE. Uh, so anything I say tonight is entirely my, my own thing, and that's it. Uh, the second thing, and this is the more important thing, there's a very big difference between giving legal and tax information and legal and tax advice. Uh, there's a big difference between saying, now, here's what the law is all about, and here's what you should do, and here's what you should do, and here's what you should do. I don't know any of you well enough to be able to give you one-on-one -on -one advice tonight, although I'm certainly going to try during the Q&A to answer as many questions as you have. Uh, it's not the same as, giving, as, as telling you that you should do something specific. So if I do say something tonight and it sounds like a good idea and you follow it and it doesn't work out and you end up uh, filing bankruptcy and your spouse divorces you and your kids leave you and your dog pees on your leg and you end up you know, living in a diaper box under the Brooklyn Bridge, uh, it's you can't really sue anybody, okay? That's basically what this is all about. You can't sue SCORE or me or, or anybody else. So that's, that's the, the, the most important piece of information on that slide. Before we begin our program, though, I'm going to do something a little bit, a little bit uh, unusual here. Uh, we're going to solve a mystery here, uh, and that is the mystery of the missing Mozart cello concerto, okay? Everybody here knows who Mozart was, right? One of the great classical composers, lived in Vienna in the late 1700s. And he was one of the most prolific composers of all time. Didn't live that long. He only lived to 35 years old. Um, but he was a champion at writing certain types of music. And during his time, one of the most popular pieces of music was something called the concerto. Uh, the concerto is a piece of music. It usually has three movements uh, in which a solo instrument and an orchestra talk to one another. Uh, a, 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 an orchestra will pick up a passage and the solo will still develop it and they kind of go back and forth and develop the theme. And this happens three times. It's called the concerto. Uh, Mozart was one of the champion concerto writers of all time. He wrote 27 concertos for the piano forte, which was the, the earlier version of the piano during his time. Um, he wrote um, seven concertos for the violin. He wrote concertos for the oboe, uh, for the flute. Uh, he actually wrote uh, four beautiful concertos for the French horn, uh, which at that time was a very new instrument. It was just being added to the orchestra in his, uh, in his time. Uh, and these concertos are among you know, the, some of the best works ever written for the French horn. I, I know French, some French horn players, and they all tell me that the Mozart concertos are like the pinnacle of, that partic uh, of the concertos that have been, ever been written for that instrument. So, you know, but here's a mystery for you. Mozart, throughout his entire life, short as it was, never wrote a concerto for the cello. And this has surprised musicologists and music historians for many years because we know something. We know Mozart knew how to play the cello. That was one of several instruments he knew how to play. We also know that the cello was one of his favorite instruments. We know this from his correspondence and letters that he wrote to various people uh, that he adored the cello. The cello is the instrument of all the instruments in the orchestra. The cello is the one that most closely uh, resembles the human voice in its range, and he loved that. Uh, but he never wrote a concerto for the cello. And this has mystified people for the longest time. But there's a reason, there's actually a very, very simple reason for it. Um, 
And, 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 and it, again, if you think of Mozart as a musical genius, as a composer, as a, a great musician, you're probably never going to get it. Because you wonder yourself, I mean, why? I mean, when was one of his favorite instruments, why did he never write one? I mean, it seems silly, okay? But if you think about Mozart as a business person, as somebody who made his living writing music, I mean, this is how he, fe he fed his family. He was a home-based entrepreneur, as many of you are here in this room. If you think of him as an entrepreneur, if you think of him as a business person, then the answer is simple. The reason why we do not have a Mozart, uh, a cello concerto by Mozart is because he couldn't find anyone to pay him to write one. That's the difference. P composers do not just write what comes into their head. Uh, artists do not just paint whatever happens. You know, Mozart was a brilliant composer. I mean, I'm not knocking him in any way. Uh, everything that he put his pen to or his quill to was a work of genius. But he didn't put pen to parchment or quill to parchment until somebody, you know, a rich nobleman or something like that, parted with a few gold ducats, you know, to make him write whatever it was. The reason why we have the French horn concertos, for example, is because a local nobleman uh, in Salzburg, Austria, had a son who was very fond of this instrument, and he wanted to have pieces that would challenge his son's uh, abilities and show him, show off his virtuosity on this very brand new instrument. That's why we have the four French horn concertos. We don't have the cello, a cello concerto because there was no similar nobleman interested in the cello, interested enough in the cello to pay Mozart to write to write one. Okay, there's a very strong lesson in that. Mozart is, was a genius, but the reason why his catalog looks the way he does is solely a function of the commissions he received. Look at any two composers, you know, why is it that one composer did mostly chamber music and another one did mostly symphonies? It all depends on who paid them and who enabled them to have the, the economic freedom to be able to produce the works of genius that they did. So that's the mystery of the Mozart cello concerto, okay? Art is a business. If you create stuff that doesn't sell, we have a name for that in the business world. We call that a hobby. Now, the IRS has, has a very technical de uh, uh, definition of what's a hobby versus a business. But for purposes of this program, if you're doing anything that nobody's buying, uh, if there are no customers for what you are doing, that's called a hobby. To have a successful business, you must have customers. You must have people paying you for the, the services, for the artwork that you are doing. Uh, to qualify for business deductions, the IRS requires that you make money uh, sooner, or later. Uh, sooner or later. The IRS has a rule that if you're doing something that is very creative and you want to treat it as a business, you must be making a profit, you know, at least two out of the last three years. You know, once you, once you get going. Uh, obviously, when you're first starting out, you can't do that. They'll give you a little slack. But if you've been painting for 10 years, taking all kinds of crazy deductions, you know, going to Europe, you know, and deducting your travel costs and stuff like that, but you've never sold a single painting, sooner or later, the IRS is going to have a problem with that, and you're going to have an audit on your hands. That's the lesson of that, okay? Very, two very famous artists, Van Gogh and Picasso. You know them both, right? Both absolute geniuses. You know, both brilliant artists, you know, their paintings and stuff are all in the Louvre and the major, uh, the major uh, museums in Europe. But one ignored his market, that's Van Gogh. The other worshipped his market. Okay, Van Gogh created some brilliant works of art, but he died, he shot himself, as you know. Uh, I can't remember what his age was, but he was a very young man uh, in a wheat field in southern France. Picasso lived to a very ripe old age, and when he died was probably the most celebrated artist of his time, if not the entire 20th century. Both are famous, but which, who would you rather up, end up as? Let's be very, if you have the choice, okay? Um, obviously, you'd rather end up as Picasso. Fame and business success are not incompatible. Shakespeare was not a failure. Shakespeare was a brilliant theatrical entrepreneur. In fact, uh, scholars really think that he wrote the plays that he did because he needed good stuff for his theater. He wanted his theater to, uh, his theater was in competition with several other theatrical companies in London at that time, and he wanted to have the best stuff for his theater, so he couldn't find it from anybody else, so he wrote his own plays. This is how he became a playwright second and a theater producer first. Great art speaks to the eternal not the transitional. That's a, that's a quote from somebody. I can't remember who ever said, whoever said that. When you're, when you're writing art, you're not just doing stuff for the here and now, for the moment. 
um, you, 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 you want to try to write for, for the eternal. You want to write, to, to write things, to produce art that will be, that will be popular even 500 years from now. Um, but you will starve if it doesn't sell. Um, about a year or two ago, my wife and I uh, went to the Westport Country Playhouse uh, down in Lower Fairfield County, and we saw a play. I had never heard of, of the play or the playwright. Uh, the playwright was one of the, um, the only thing I can remember is that the playwright was one of the script writers for The Simpsons. Uh, he was one of the people who wrote for that cartoon show, right? And this play, uh, I won't go into any detail about it, but it was one of the funniest plays I think I have ever seen in my life. I mean, we were laughing like, like for, for like an hour and 20 minutes straight with this play. I mean, it was, it was absolutely hysterical and utterly brilliant. You know, but when we left the theater, I turned to my wife and I said, you know what, this is probably the, the, the funniest experience I've ever had in the theater, but you know what, this play is not going to be around in five years. And my wife looked at me and she said, why? Because all of the f humor was very topical and very, you know, much in the moment. This fellow just took a lot of stuff that was going on in the headlines, and that's what he made, he, he made uh, his humor out of. Will people five, ten years from now? be able to appreciate, you know, that play. I'm not so sure they will. You're going to have to tell people who were these people, these celebrities that he was making all fun of. You know, you all know celebrities are very, very fast moving and temporary thing. There are a lot of people who were superstars 10, 15 years ago that nobody cares about today. Uh, building your artwork on that is not a key to lasting success. Avoid pop culture references that may not stand the test of time, even though they may be very successful in the moment. Here are some examples. Mere material success does not guarantee lasting fame. Anybody remember who Margaret Keene was? She was the lady in the 1960s who did the paintings of the kids with the big eyes, the saucer eyes. They just made a movie uh, about her just recently, about her, her family life, because the husband always took credit for everything that she did. Uh, she's now viewed as kind of a feminist icon. Thomas Kincaid was a very famous and very successful artist. He did these wonderful paintings of cottages in the woods, basically, for, for lack of a better word, but very, very creative use of light. He had actually um, several uh, gift stores and outlet stores that only carried his art uh, in you know, malls and, and tourist uh, locations around the country. He passed away about 10 years ago, and today none of those stores are in existence. Uh, nobody really is concerned about his art anymore. Leroy Neiman, back in the 1960s and 1970s, he was a sports artist. He did a lot of art based on sporting events, racing cars and all that kind of stuff. And he had a technique that was very much like J.M.W. Turner, the English painter. It's very impressionist. You could actually get the sense of speed and motion from all his paintings. Uh, and again, very famous. His illustrations were in every major sports magazine in the world today. Most of you younger folks probably don't even know who I'm talking about. So there you go. Fame can be very fleeting, okay? Um, so, you know, don't get me wrong. Mere material success does not guarantee lasting fame. Here's another question. What do Bing Crosby, Burl Ives, Andy Williams, and Brenda Lee have in common? Now, these were all musicians. These were all singers. Some of you may not remember. Some of you younger folks probably don't even know some of these people. Uh, Bing Crosby was one of the most recorded artists of all time. Uh, back in the 1920s and 30s, big band singers were the rock stars of their time. These are the people who fronted the big bands and sang the melodies. Uh, Bing Crosby was one of the top. Back in the 1920s, a song was actually written about the three greatest uh, big band singers of all time, Bing Crosby, uh, Ross Colombo, and Rudy Valley. Okay, well, two, those last two names don't mean anything to you. Uh, they were cre solely creatures of the 1920s. But Bing Crosby had a career that spanned over 50 years. He recorded over 15,000 songs and had more number one hits than just about anyone in the 20th century. But if you know the name Bing Crosby today, what do you know him for? You know him for only one song. And what's the one song? White Christmas, right? He had a Christmas hit. Burl Ives was a, uh, a leading singer of the folk movement of the late 50s, 1950s, and early 1960s. During that era, there was a big folk music revival in the United States. Uh, they made a, a satirical movie about this a few years ago called A Mighty Wind, uh, if, you, if you ever heard about this. You know, folk singers and guitars and people with hair down to their ankles and stuff like that. It was the whole beatnik thing of the late 1950s. And Burl Ives was a leading figure of that movement. Again, a string of number one hits. He was also an actor. Uh, he won a Best Actor Oscar in 1955 for a movie that I don't even remember, but had an amazing career, right? If you ever remember Burl Ives, beautiful baritone voice. Problem is, 
Nobody remembers him today except for one thing. If you know the name Burl Ives at all today, it's because of one song, a song called Have a Holly Jolly Christmas, which is one of the sappiest Christmas songs ever written, if you, have to, if you ask my view. Um, Andy Williams was a great singer of the 1960s. My, he was one of my, 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 in fact, he had his own TV show. Uh, I believe it was on CBS or NBC. He had a, a major TV show. He's one of, he was my wife's favorite singer. My wife, my, my mother, rather, I should say, never missed uh, his show when he was around in the 1960s. But again, no one remembers him today. If you remember him at all, it was because of one Christmas song, um, which is, a, I can't even remember the name of it, but it's that stupid one where he says, um, uh, about, about the clock and, you know, and don't, hickory clock and don't, and don't forget to hang up your sock and all that. I don't remember the name of the darn song, but it's a Christmas song. You hear it on the radio every time, every Christmas. And last but not least, Brenda Lee, pop trivia question. Uh, in the, during the 20th century, um, during the 1960s, during the 1960s, who had the third highest number of number one hits? Number one was the Beatles. Number two was Elvis. Who was number three? Answer, Brenda Lee, no, who nobody remembers today um, except for her song, Rock Around the Christmas Tree. Okay, what do all these singers have in common? They are today, they were all top stars of their times, but they're today only remembered for one Christmas song. That is the only thing that stands between them and total oblivion. Okay, fame can be very fleeting. The key is genius, giving the customer what they want, but without sacrificing your product quality. Not all Mozart is great, but there is no bad Mozart. If you go anywhere in the Mozart catalog, you will find a piece of music that is enjoyable to listen to and brilliant artistically. Whatever he put his pen to, it became a work of genius. Uh, Stephen King versus Peter Straub. A lot of people don't remember, but during the 1970s and 80s, these two horror writers were arch competitors. Uh, you know, every year they came out with books and they, they competed uh, for space in the bookstores. Stephen King, you all know. What about Peter Straub? Probably never heard of him. You, can, you can go to any library book sale, you'll see a ton of old Peter Straub books. They're, they're, they never pay more than a dollar for a Peter Straub book. Um, because, and it's just, in fact, Peter Straub and Stephen King actually wrote a book together. It was called The Talisman uh, back in the late 1980s. But here's the difference. Read the two writers together and you'll see why Stephen King has survived and Peter Straub has not. The quality of the writing is very, very different uh, between these two writers. That's just a thing. My point is that fame and business success are not incompatible. These two things can be achieved. Here are the three ways that artists make money. Um, if you are in the performing arts, you make money by performing your art. If you're in the, mus if you're in the music or theater spaces, uh, they make it by selling their art. Uh, if you're in the visual arts or the graphic art spaces, paintings, photography. But the most important way that artists make money is by licensing their copyright the right to publish and reproduce the work, literally the right to make copies. We're going to talk about copyright a little bit later in the program um, um, and collecting royalties for licensing that copyright to third parties. This third way is the key to longstanding success. Why? Because it provides a steady cash flow over the long term. If you sell a painting at a gallery or at an exhibit or at a craft show, that's it. The painting's gone. You can no longer make money on that painting. You got to do another one if you want to make money. But if you're smart, you keep the copyright to that painting. And even though you sell the painting, the actual physical object to somebody else, the copyright stays with you. And you can make a ton of money on, on, on the copyright to works that you have actually sold and that you no longer possess. Uh, so, for example, a lot of artists, when they do a new work, they do seriographs, they do lithographs. Even though the original work sells at an auction or something like that, they still have that copyright, and they're still making money off that piece of art, even though the actual physical painting is sold. There are actually copyrights still in existence and still enforceable for works of art that were destroyed by the Nazis during World War II. So even though the physical art is no longer even in existence, the copyrights are still in existence, and they're still making money for the artists, or, of course, after all this time, uh, the artist's estates. Okay, here's a trivia question. Name the highest grossing American play of the 20th century. I won't say of all time, but the 20th century, 1900 to 2000. I mean, don't be mad. I mean, we're doing a video, obviously, so I don't expect you to answer this question. West it's a play you probably... West, West Side Story? <laughs> West Side Story. Okay, that's pretty good. Not, not a musical. Oh. A play. 
okay? This is very tricky. Think about it. Okay, a, a straight dramatic play. Something by Arthur Miller? No. Something by, you know, name your favorite, you know, 20th century playwright, or at least the one they made you read in high school that you didn't care for very much, but he was supposed to be famous. Okay, the, um, the, the answer is no. It's a play you probably, you, you would never heard of. It was a play that appeared on Broadway. Uh, it, it appeared on Broadway for only seven months. And it starred a famous Hollywood actor. Um, but it was during the war years. It was during the 1940s, and people were just, just not going to the theater in great numbers. It was later made into a very successful movie, but the play, even though it was written and performed in 1942, is still being performed today. In fact, if some of you who, had to, who were into drama in high school, you may have acted in this play at some point. The play was by an author, a one-time, um, a, a one-hit wonder named Joseph Kesselring, and the play is called Arsenic and Old Lace. Has many, many of you ever heard of it? It only lasted on Broadway for seven months. The actor, by the way, was Boris Karloff, who was then hot off doing Frankenstein. He played the part of the, the brother, the guy, the one that was criminally insane, the one that breaks out of the insane asylum and hides the body in the house and all that kind of stuff. That was it. Even with all that, the play only lasted for seven months, but the play still lives on in repertory and still makes money. Every time a high school you know, drama club does arsenic and old lace, the Kessel Ring estate makes money, okay? So that's the point. Even though, it's, even though the, uh, the work itself was not of great value, those continuing royalties and copyrights last forever, okay? If you have to take away one thing from this presentation, folks, um, this, is, this is the slide. And it's so important, I'm going to read it verbatim. The key to success for any creative business is to control and exploit the intellectual property rights to the artworks rather than the works themselves. The copyrights are more important than the arts, than the, than the actual works themselves. Never give those suckers away, okay? Successful artists tailor their art to what the customers want. They only create what sells. Mozart didn't write any piece of music until he had some kind of a commission from some wealthy nobleman. They know the market and what it really wants, not what it says it wants. Uh, again, going to classical music, I default to music for a lot of my examples. Okay, George Gershwin and Arnold Schoenberg were two of the greatest composers of the 20th century. George Gershwin was primarily known for incorporating jazz into his classical music compositions in the 20s and 30s. Arnold Schoenberg invented the 12-tone system of serial composition, which did away with tonality entirely. If you've ever listened to music from both these, co these composers, if I had free tickets... To an, to a, if I wanted to give you free tickets to either a George Gershwin concert or an Arnold Schoenberg concert, which ones would you take? Okay, you would definitely take the George Gershwin. Arnold Schoenberg's music is brilliant mathematically, but it's painful to listen to. Uh, fortunately, most of his pieces are under 10 minutes, but even those 10 minutes can be excruciating in a concert hall. Uh, forgive me, I, I am not a big fan of his and I never have been. You build a recognizable brand image to build repeat sales. You want to be able to create a lot of works in a relatively short period of time, and that's very hard to do if you're creating everything from scratch each time. What you want to do is you want to build a template and then work off of that template over and over again. Uh, Joseph Haydn wrote 104 symphonies uh, in the course of a 40-year career. He can only do that because the rules were very set. All he had to do was, build, was plug in different melodies into his template, and he could grind these things out like sausage. Uh, Thomas Kincaid had the same template for his cottages in the woods. He could execute that same basic thing over and over again. Mystery writers, if you're, if you're a fan of murder mysteries and things like that, you know the plots are always the same thing. It's the same thing over and over again. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's a key character, a detective, who's very flawed, and he always does the same things. Look at all the James Bond movies. They, all, James Bond always does the same stuff in each one of these movies. You know, he's chased by a helicopter. He has to go visit Q and learn the latest technology and all this kind of stuff. Look at the plots of the James Bond movie. They're all the same. You, you want to build a brand image and build repeat performance that helps build your branch. You know yourself, if you have a, a, a favorite artist, you go to the the museum and you can tell that person's artwork a mile away. Okay. If you, if you're a jewelry fan, if you go into a jewelry store, you can spot a David Yermans right off the bat. You can tell exactly what his stuff looks like. Build a recognizable brand image. 
And again, control the intellectual property rights, the copyright, the publishing rights to all of your work, okay? A lot of you guys don't know this, but the Beatles, in the early 60s, um, they were brilliant musicians, incredible songwriters, uh, probably some of the best pop musicians who have ever lived, but they, they weren't too good at business. Uh, their manager, a fellow named Brian Epstein, was not the most sophisticated music, music manager that he could have been. And he made a very fateful decision in 1966. Uh, he basically created a trust with two other very wealthy individuals, and he put the copyrights to all of the Beatles catalog up to that point, the early stuff, the Beatlemania stuff, into that trust. Well, the other two business people that he did business with, with were kind of sharks and they took real advantage of him. Within two years, they took control of the trust and the Beatles lost the rights to getting royalties from all those songs. Uh, the trust, you know, uh, the trust changed hands a number of times uh, and eventually the trust broke up and it sold the uh, rights to all of these Beatles songs. And who was the winning bidder at the auction? Michael Jackson. Yeah, him, that Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson, the, music, the singer ended up owning all the copyrights to the early Beatles songs, pre-1966. This is why, by the way, the Beatles formed Apple Corp and then started using that as the publishing vehicle for their music because they learned their lesson. They realized at that point, that's why up until very recently, you very rarely hear the early Beatles hits on radio, by the way. Uh, you always hear the later stuff, you know, the Abbey Road stuff and all that, but you very rarely hear the early stuff. It's because the copyrights were tangled up for so many years that the radio, that the radio stations couldn't play it. When was the last time you heard A Hard Day's Night or I Want to Hold Your Hand or something? You're starting to do it now. Uh, and the reason why is because I, when uh, Michael Jackson died, Paul McCartney uh, did a deal with his estate. Uh, we don't know the terms of the deal. It was private. We don't know exactly what the deal was, but for a very sizable amount of money, probably upwards of a billion dollars, Paul McCartney was able to get back the rights to the songs that he co-wrote with John Lennon back in the 1960s. He had to pay a billion dollars to get the rights back to the songs that he actually wrote. Can you imagine that? Um, copy, when copyrights go, go astray, very, very bad things happen. So now let's talk about copyright. I've been using this term now throughout the presentation, but, and, I, and just so you know, um, if you follow my YouTube channel, I do have a 75-minute uh, program called Copyright Basics for artists, photographers, and other creative types. It's absolutely free. If you go to youtube.com, search for my name, Cliff Enico, you'll see all the videos that I have. Look for the one called Copyright Basics. Um, Copyright Basics, that's the one you wanna look for. It's a 75 minute program. I'm not gonna go into that detail tonight, but I just wanna give you the basics of what a copyright is and how it works. And the best way that I can do this is to ask you to shut your eyes for a minute. I want you all to think about, I want you to picture in your mind, the Mona Lisa. You, know, um, you can do this with any kind of artwork, but I prefer to do it with paintings. It's just a lot easier. Picture the Mona Lisa sitting on, flat on a table, okay? The actual Mona Lisa, okay? Now, about 18 inches above the painting, okay? Picture a hologram, a three-dimensional hologram that looks exactly like the Mona Lisa down to the very last brush stroke, but you can, it's three-dimensional, it's intangible. You can stick your hand through it. It's just floating there in the air. It doesn't have any tangible existence, okay? Now, last but not least, take the Mona Lisa, the painting, and remove it from the frame and leave the hologram where it is. Okay, now you can open your eyes. Okay, back up again. I hope you don't mind my doing this. It's a little bit of California visualization and stuff, but I find it's really helpful, okay? The copyright is the hologram. Every work of art, whatever it is, if it's a music, music, art, photo photograph, whatever, has a copyright that attaches to it. The copyright is the hologram, okay? It looks exactly like the work of art that was originally created, but it's intangible. You can't see it, you can't touch it, you feel it. It's just like a 3D hologram. And the copyright does not always follow the work. If the work gets sold, that's why I told you to move the Mona Lisa off the table. When the work gets sold, the copyright stays where it is unless the artist sells the copyright along with the work of art. The two things move independently is my point, okay? A copyright has nothing to do with ownership. A lot of people say, oh, if you have a copyright on something, you own it. 
you know, you can do whatever you want with it. That's actually not true. A copyright is something quite different. A copyright is a legal monopoly. It is the right to exclude anybody else from making money from this work of art for a specific period of time. It varies depending on the type of work of art it is. Uh, copyrights go for different terms. We'll talk about that in a minute. But it's a legal monopoly. Now, our legal system does not like monopolies. Okay, we are a capitalist economy. We do not like monopolies because if somebody has a monopoly on something, it means they can set whatever price they want for it. And that hurts consumers. It hurts a lot of people. We generally like to have competition, like to see competition in our economy. But this is a situation, a very rare one, where the government is actually giving you a monopoly and saying it's okay for a certain period of time. You created this, you put your time and effort into it, so only you can make money from this for a period of time. It's literally the right to make copies. That's it. For once, a legal term means exactly what it says. It's, a, it's, a, it's the right to make copies. That's essentially what the copyright is. And, and it, it, it's not just one thing. It's a bundle of rights. It's a bunch of things. So for example, if I take a bunch of pens here, okay, this is what a copyright looks like. It's a collection of various rights that are granted to the artists. And when you create a work of art, all of these pens belong to you. When you, you do deals with other people to exploit the copyright, you give some of your pens away. And maybe you give all of them away, you know, or, but, but sometimes you only give away some. And whatever pens you don't give away, you keep. That is how a copyright works. It's really, it's really that simple. I have to use some visuals with this because it's very hard, it's very intangible. Okay, what does copyright protect? It protects original works of authorship. And you have to underscore the word original here. Literary, dramatic, musical, and artistic works, poetry, novels, movies, songs. Uh, computer software, by the way, is copyrighted. It's not trademarked. And architecture, since 1990, you can copyright a building design if it is truly unique and distinctive. So for example, uh, that art museum, uh, the Guggenheim Museum that uh, Frank Gehry designed in Bilbao, Spain, that has the very, you know, um, the very sharp profiles, all the angles and all that stuff, that is actually a copyrighted design. No other museum or other public building can use that exact same design without uh, Mr. Gehry's consent, okay? But that's only been since 1990 that they've allowed that. What copyright does not protect, it does not protect ideas. It protects the way they are expressed, you know, the actual expression of the, of the idea, but not the idea itself. So if I wanted to write a series of novels about a young boy who's kind of a loner and nobody likes him, and all of a sudden he discovers that he's a wizard, he has all these magical powers, and you know, there's this place, this school that's especially for kids like him and stuff like that, I could do it. I could do it as long as I don't as I don't copy too closely what J.K. Rowling did with Harry Potter, I am perfectly free to do that. In fact, a, a, an author has actually done that. Uh, his name is Lev Grossman. He's written, he's written a series of books. They just made one of his into a movie called The Magicians. And when you read this book, it's basically Harry Potter for grown-ups. Uh, it's, uh, you know, Harry Potter in, in the books is this, you know, grade school, early middle school kid. These are a bunch of high school and college kids who realize that they have magic powers and they go to this special place where they learn all kinds of stuff. Um, but, it's, but it's very different than Harry Potter. No one will ever say that Mr. Grossman infringed uh, J.K. Rowling's copyrights. It's a very different story. But the basic ideas are exactly the same as Harry Potter. You cannot protect an idea, okay? Um, if you want to learn more about copyright, please watch my YouTube video. It's probably the best 60, 70 minutes that you will spend on this topic. Uh, and again, this is totally free. Just go to my YouTube channel, search for Cliff Enico, and then search for Copyright Basics, it's called, is the title of the program. What's the difference between a copyright versus a trademark? A copyright protects um, works of authorship. A trademark does not protect those. They protect what are called marks. These are brand images that are used in commerce. So for example, um, the name Ronzoni for pasta is a registered trademark, uh, but it doesn't have to be a word. Uh, it, it can be a graphic. So for example, the Pillsbury Doughboy is a registered trademark of the Pillsbury Company. The McDonald's Golden Arches is a trademark. I mean, they're works of art, but they are not being protected as original works of authorship. They're being protected because they're being used as a symbol to identify a product or service in the marketplace. That's the difference. Uh, you don't trademark a name, you trademark a mark. 
Uh, now, where it ties into a creative business, though, an author of a graphic novel, you know, a comic, a comic book, can copyright the texts and graphics. That's all copyrightable. That's art, words, combination thereof. But if he creates a character that recurs and the character develops a brand identity of his own, it is possible to trademark a character. So for example, Mickey Mouse is a registered trademark of the Disney company. And please, uh, if you are ever doing anything creative like emojis and stuff like that, please do not use the Mickey Mouse uh, character. Disney is ruthless about enforcing their trademarks. Uh, and if they see you doing anything with any of their proprietary characters, they will come after you with baseball bats. They are you know, really nasty, very aggressive about protecting their trademarks. So you gotta be careful about that. Some, some people are a little bit you know, more aggressive than others, but the Disney people are on it. As we say in our field, you do not mess with the mouse. You just don't. Um, you may be able to trademark an artist's look and feel. Uh, Thomas Kincaid tried to do that actually in the 1990s. He tried to get a copyright on his particular use of, of Charoscuro, the light that he used in his paintings, but it didn't get very far. The trademark office did not buy that. Uh, you can't really trademark, every once in a while you can trademark the look and feel of something, but those are very rare cases and the trademark office does not want to give people broad ownership over things like that. They want that to be as precise as possible. Here's what copyright gives you. The copyright, these are, these are the pens. These are the bundle of rights that you get with copyright. It gives you the exclusive right to publish and make copies of the work. Again, it's the right to make copies. It also gives you the exclusive right to profit from the work and any derivative works. And this is a very powerful right. When you get a copyright into a work of art, you don't just get the copyright on that thing. You get it also to any other works that are based on that thing. So if I write a best-selling novel and Hollywood grabs that and turns it into a screenplay and a movie, I own the copyright to the screenplay and the movie, even if it's based on my novel. Even though the novel, uh, the movie may look completely different than the, the original work of art. If you've ever read the original Wizard of Oz, have you, anybody, seriously, when, next time you're, you're, you, you have some time on your hands, um, read the original Wizard of Oz book by L. Frank Baum. He wrote it sometime around 1910 or something like that. And then watch the famous Wizard of Oz movie uh, with Judy Garland and all. They are two almost entirely different stories. Uh, the two books, the two stories really have very little to do with each other. But the L. Frank Baum, <clears throat> the L. Frank Baum estate is still getting royalties on the movie rights that, that he sold, you know, to Warner Brothers or what was it, MGM, uh, back in the 1930s. His estate still gets money from that because it was based on his story. The movie was a derivative work of his original novel. Then last, uh, the, the exclusive right to edit, alter, or change the work, okay? If someone buys your painting... They can do whatever they want with it, just about. They can hang it up on their wall. They can burn it. They can destroy it. They can, you know, slash it up. They can do whatever they want, but they can't change it without your permission. Uh, and that is true of any work of art that you do. Um, you know, uh, and there's a certain limit. There's certain exceptions to that, uh, but they're few and far between. Last but not least, it gives you the exclusive right to sue others who infringe your copyright and make them pay through the nose. If you see somebody out there that is using your stuff and putting their name on it, you have the right to go after them and make them pay you for that. You know, if you can prove that, that you have the valid copyright. I believe it or not, I do this. I have several articles on my website at cliffenico.com, which is my law firm website. And one of those is a very popular outline. It's called Demystifying the Business Organization. It talks about the difference between LLCs and corporations and S corporations, all the different ways you can legally organize a business. It's only about eight pages long, but it's been downloaded from my website over a million times. Uh, and it's been translated into several different languages. It's probably the best thing I've ever written, and I've never made a dime off it, uh, which shows you how good a businessman I am. <laughs> okay, so most of you in this room are hopefully a little bit better than I am. But every once in a while, what I did with this, this, this article, though, is in several places, I used several unusual turns of phrase. I phrased things in a way that isn't normal. And what I did was, when I first put this thing up on my website, I then set up Google Alerts for those specific phrases that I put in there. And I can't tell you, hardly a month goes by that I don't get a Google alert 
uh, showing me that somebody has taken my article, they've put it up on their website, they've had it retyped in a different format, different font, different text, and they put their name on it. And they're trying to get away with that. And I'm able to shut these people down because of the Google or I send them a nasty cease and desist letter saying, you know, look, you I just come to my attention. You have been ripping off my article. Uh, I just compared the two. They're exactly word for word identical. They're only five words apart. There is no way you could have created this yourself. Cease and desist or I will require payments of you of at least $1,000 a month as long as, you're up, as long as that's up on your website. And believe me, they take it down. You know, so when you're, so you got to be, so whenever you're, you have a copyright, it's very important that you protect it. Uh, that you take action to help. So how do you profit from copyright? Well, there's two ways. You can either sell or license the copyright. Those are the only two ways to do it. When you sell a copyright, and by the way, an assignment and a sale are, two to, are exactly the same thing. When you assign a copyright, remember those pens. Here's my copyright, okay, to whatever. If I'm selling the copyright, I'm giving all my pens away. That's what I'm doing. I'm taking all these pens and I'm handing them to this, this young lady here. So later on, I'll, I'll, you can certainly have a pen. Score would like that, I think. Uh, we, everybody here can get a pen. That's okay. Okay. That's what a sale is. You no longer own it. It's no longer yours. The copyright, the hologram is now no longer yours. It's gone over to somebody else and they have the right to make copies. If you, if you do write a book, and you sell it to a publisher, your publisher in their agreement is gonna want an assignment of the copyright. They're not gonna take a license. They're gonna want an assignment of the copyright because they are taking the risk of publishing this book and the risk that the book is not gonna do well. So they wanna make sure that you can't go and sell rights behind their back and take away from that. So you will always be asked to assign your copyrights. But here's the trick, okay? Whenever somebody else is publishing your work and they ask for an assignment of copyright, Always, always, always be sure that you ask for what's called a reversion clause. This is a clause in the contract that says that if the work fails to sell, uh, if, if it goes out of print, uh, if your company ceases to do business, if you go bankrupt, um, you know, or, or if the work sells fewer than X copies within a Y period of time, the, all the copyright comes back to you. That is a very, very important clause to have in the agreement. If, if Brian Epstein, the Beatles manager, had had the foresight to put that clause in when he sold the Beatles copyrights to the trust, the Beatles would have gotten their rights back when the trust broke up. That didn't happen, okay? The trust was allowed to sell those copyrights to all sorts of people, and that's how Michael Jackson got his hands on them. Okay, everybody with me so far? Make sure whenever you assign your copyright to somebody else or you sell it, get a clause that says that under certain circumstances, if you're no longer publicizing this work, I want that copyright back and it has to come back to me. Uh, I have a, a, a book right now. I've written 16 books in my life and I have a book that is right now with its third publisher. The first two went out of business, but I was able to get the copyright back because I had, the, I had a reversion clause in my contract and I was able to sell it to somebody else. So the book is still in print today, uh, although albeit on its third publisher. Um, it's, it's a legal, it's an interview guide for lawyers in case you're interested. It's kind of a how-to book for young lawyers. Uh, it's pretty popular in, in the law school community. Okay, now a license is the better way to go. When you license, your copyright, you're only giving some of the rights to somebody. So if I were to take three of these pens and give it to this young lady in front, I still have the other three in my hand and I can still do things with those. A license is a sale of some of your rights, not all of them. You retain all of them except for those you specifically grant to the licensee, okay? and the license automatically expires at the end of its stated term unless the parties renew it. It's not, it's not, an assignment is in, is in perpetuity, it's forever. A license is only for a certain number of years and at the end of that time, the rights automatically come back to you that you sold, okay? So for example, take a look at my copyright notice on the slides, by the way. I say copyright 2018 by Clifford R. Enico, all rights reserved. I am licensing you the right to look and to make copies of my presentation today. I'm not giving you all my pens, okay? You don't have the right to take this and put this on your website or to go and start making money doing this exact same presentation for other people. I'm still holding on to some of my pens. That's what the all rights reserved language means legally. Be very careful when you post artwork to social media. There are clauses 
in every social media sites, if you look at their users agreement, their terms of service, uh, everyone, and I'm not just singling out Facebook here, they all do this. Uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, Pinterest. There's a clause in there that says that by posting your stuff on our, web, on our website, we own the rights to it and we can do whatever we want with your stuff. You know that? It's in there. It's in every one of the terms and conditions for every one of the major social media sites. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm sure the intent here is good. It's not that Mr. Zuckerberg wants to grab your stuff and then sell it and make a, make a billion dollars because he already has a billion dollars. He doesn't need another one. Um, but he doesn't need any more than what he has. But what, what he's saying here is that if you do something really cool on Facebook and you know, we wanna make, we wanna exploit that, we have the right to do it without getting your permission. So if they wanted to do a, a let's be very silly for a moment, if they wanted to do a coffee table book of the 100 best Facebook postings ever done on Facebook and they wanted yours as one of those, they could do that and you don't get any royalties from that. That's what that clause essentially means. But the way it's written, if you're an artist or a photographer and you put a photograph up there, technically, they have the right to license that photograph to other people to use on their websites and you don't get any money out of that. And I don't think they're doing that. I don't think they're going to do that, but they have the legal right to do that. So here's my advice for artists and photographers. When, do not put your actual artwork up on Facebook or Instagram or Pinterest. Put a notice up saying, hey, I've got some cool new photographs of my trip to Trinidad. Uh, here's where you can find them on my website and give a link. Now that, what that does is it takes those artworks now out of Facebook's uh, user agreement and it puts it on yours. Now the, 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 your artwork should only exist on your website. Why? Because you control the rules there, okay? When something is on your website, you, own, you have all the rights, you, you own all the copyright to that stuff and you can do whatever you want to with that stuff. You don't have to worry about Facebook or Instagram or Pinterest or any of these other places. Just don't put the actual artwork up on their site. Just put a notice up there or do a posting saying, hey, I got a great new collection. This is going to a gallery in three months. Uh, click here to see them. And then the link should go to your website. That's the right way to handle that on, uh, on social media. Do not put the artwork up yourself on, on the social media site where it's under their rules. I apologize for this slide. This slide has some extremely small type. Um, but it's a very important slide. This is a, a clause about artists' contracts. Um, so for example, when you consign works to galleries, um, you should always dictate the terms of sale. Uh, so for example, most of my artist clients put a floor in their contracts. You will not sell the painting for less than X without my permission. Uh, that's a classic example. The gallery never ever sells to copyright. All they can sell is the painting itself. Now, some galleries do lithographs and serigraphs for their clients. And if they do, you may want to take advantage of that because they'll probably do a better job than you will yourself. They're, they know that business, they're used to it. Um, but you do not want them to be able to make re reproductions on your own without paying you and without, the authors, without your authorization, okay? Also too, the gallery must maintain insurance. Fires do happen at art galleries. Um, and people steal stuff from art galleries. So you want to make sure that the, uh, that the gallery has sufficient insurance. And when, you, when you're dealing with a mom and pop gallery, be very sure that they have enough insurance to, uh, to protect your works of art. Contracts with agents and reps. Okay, so for example, for a while I used a literary agent. I don't anymore because uh, quite frankly, I don't need that person anymore in my life. I can do all the contract negotiations myself. Uh, they're not really earning their keep, but if you are going to work with an agent or a rep, make sure that the agent cannot bind you to a deal without your consent. Anything has to be, re any deal that they want to strike has to be referred to you and you get the final say as to whether you do it or not. Don't give them an exclusive without getting a guarantee of some kind. If they want to be your exclusive agent, they don't want you dealing with any other agents, well, that's fine, but then you, get, you have to get at least a minimum number of sales every year and they have to guarantee that. And if they don't, they lose their exclusivity. They still have the right to sell your stuff, but it's no longer exclusive if they don't generate at least $100,000 in sales a, a year for you. Um, and then either side can terminate the contract on 30 days prior written notice. In fact, that language, by the way, should be in every contract you ever signed. Nobody can predict the future, folks. I can't, you can't, nobody can. The minute Murphy's Law, you know what Murphy's Law is? Anything that can go wrong will go wrong. The minute you sign up with an agent, 10 days later, you find a better agent. 
who's more excited about you, they have better contacts, and you want to deal with that agent. Every contract you should be able to break on 30 days uh, notice. Putting that language in, your con in all of your contracts will save you a lot of heartache. So even if you don't do a good job drafting the contract, even though there's mistakes in it, even though there's problems with it, worst case, all you got to do is pull the plug and 30 days later it's gone. It's out of your life. So it's just a little thing. When I look at a contract as a lawyer, my question is always, how is the client going to get out of it? How hard is it going to be for them to get out of this because something better comes along? especially my artist clients. I, I, I'm very concerned about that. So I always want to make sure that they can get out of that contract anytime. We call it snap on, snap off. All they have to do is give 30 days notice and they're out of the contract. Okay. Book contracts with publishers. Okay. You must assign the copyright to them. But again, the rights should revert to you if sales fall below a certain level. Don't give them subsidiary rights. Subsidiary rights is a very technical term. Look it up online. Basically, when you give publishers uh, the right to publish the book, they also want a lot of other stuff. They want the right to do foreign translations, for example. Uh, they want the right maybe to do an ebook. I'm sorry, an ebook or an audio book, you know, where somebody actually reads your book. We used to call the books on tape. Now, of course, they're all on you know, CDs and DVDs. They may want the right, in some cases, to negotiate the film rights if someone wants to make a movie out of your book. Those are all called subsidiary rights. And there's a clause in the contract that basically says that you are granting them, in addition to the right to publish the work, you're granting them the subsidiary rights and, you know, to every, in all forms, in whatever media, uh, whether now existing or hereafter developed. Don't be so quick to sign that. Ask your, ask the, ask your publisher, are you doing all that stuff? So, for example, if your publisher has never done an audio book before, they're a mom and pop publisher, why are you giving them the audio rights? That makes no sense. If your author, if your publisher does not go to the Frankfurt Book Fair in Germany, in Frankfurt, Germany every year, that's where they sell, uh, all the publishers sell rights to buy and sell rights to foreign translations. If they're only publishing in the United States, why are you giving them the translation rights, the foreign, the, the foreign translation rights? You shouldn't be doing this if they are not actually doing that stuff. Be, don't be afraid to question your publisher. And again, if they're not doing something, get that pen back in your hand. That's a pen that you want to keep for future reference, okay? Let's just talk about taxes. We're almost done here. Um, be, you are a business. You are not a hobby. Therefore, you must pay taxes, okay? Generally, the rules are that even if, you, if you're doing anything and you make at least $1 of profit from that thing, you are required to pay income tax on that profit, okay? If you're making money, the IRS does not care whether you are a hobby or a business. They want your money. They want you to report that income. They want you to pay taxes on it. The difference, the big difference between a hobby and a business comes about when you're losing money. If you have a business and you are losing money, you can deduct all kinds of wonderful stuff. You can deduct all of your expenses, the cost of your materials, uh, your trip to uh, the Frankfurt Book Fair, you know, if your publisher lets you go along on that, your, your, uh, any kind of seminar that you go to. So if you go to a writer's workshop and spend a month there, you can deduct a lot of those kinds of expenses. Um, you know, education expenses, you can do all that. And if you do have a loss, you can carry it forward. Uh, for indefinitely now, because of the new tax bill, the one that went into effect in January, uh, the Trump bill, um, they changed this. It used to be that you could only carry them back and carry them forward a certain number of years. Well, you can't carry your, your losses back anymore under the new tax law. You can't go back and amend your prior year's returns and claim them. But you can carry them forward into future years, and there's no limit. You can carry those losses forward for 30 or 40 years. Although if you're carrying your losses forward that much, I really question how good an artist you are. Quite frankly, if you're not making money, you know, by that point, I really, really question how good your, your, your artwork is. You, you probably will have had an audit by the IRS at that point if you're not making money after, after two or three years or maybe a little bit longer. Okay, always be an independent contractor, okay? You never, ever want to be somebody's employee. Uh, you never sign a work made for hire clause when you are doing work for a customer. So a lot of customers will sometimes ask for this, fight it. Um, there's something called, in copyright, there's something called the work made for hire doctrine. This means that if I ask you to create a work of art for me and I am your employer, a w, your W-2 for me, I own the rights to, all the, to the work that you create. And you don't have to assign your copyright to me. Uh, I own it because it was done for me as part of uh, your employment contract with me. 
Okay, that's called the work made for hire doctrine. It applies to employees, but it does not apply to independent contractors. If I ask you to do a work of, of art for me as on a 1099 basis, as an independent contractor, and, I, and you do not assign the copyright to me, you still own the copyright, even though I paid you for that work of art. This was established in a famous 1989 case, we call it the Reed case. Uh, for those of you who are Supreme Court junkies uh, out there, uh, this was the last decision that Thurgood Marshall wrote for the Supreme Court before he retired uh, from the court back in 1989. Reed was a sculptor, um, and apparently a very known one, a very well-known one. He was commissioned by a nonprofit organization that was formed to help the homeless. Uh, they were doing a lot of uh, good things for homeless people. They were a 501c3 organization, and they wanted to put a statue of a homeless person outside of their headquarters in Washington, D.C. So they commissioned Reed to do this. It was a bronze sculpture. And he did the sculpture, and they paid him. They paid him everything he asked for. And they put the sculpture, sculpture out in front of their building, and it was very controversial. It was considered very ugly. It was very modern. It, it kind of clashed with buildings in the neighborhood and things like that. And um, they got a lot of negative feedback about that sculpture. So they went back to Reed and said, you know, the sculpture really isn't working for us. Could you please make these few changes? We've, been, we, we, we've gotten some other artists to look at your work. If you just make these few changes, and we'll pay you for them, we'll pay you extra for the changes, because this is extra work, uh, you know, we'll be happy and, and we'll be fine. And he said, no, that, uh, I'm not changing my work. That is my artistic vision. Uh, that's exactly what I felt that statue should look back. And if you change it in any way, I will sue you. Well, they went back to their lawyers and their lawyers said, well, wait a minute, you paid him. You know, statue's yours. You can do whatever the heck you want with it. So they went out and they fixed it. Reed sued them for copyright infringement, went all the way to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court, Thurgood Marshall, sided with the artist. They said, you know what? You know, he sold you the work. He sold you the sculpture, but he did not sell you the hologram. He did not sell you the copyright. You know, so the copyright stayed with Reed and he had the right to prevent you from making changes to his work, even though you paid him every penny he asked for for it. And that rule is still the fact today. Whenever you are doing work for as an independent contractor for somebody else, you own that copyright unless you specifically assign it to the person who commissioned you. OK, and the flip side of that is if you're an artist and you're and you're having other people do work for you. So, for example, let's say you're a web designer and you're having somebody else do some of the uh, the applications and all the applets and stuff like that. Make sure you get an assignment of rights clause from them saying they assign the copyright to all of their work to you. Otherwise, that person owns a piece of your work, even though you paid them for the work that they did. They own, they own that piece of work. You know, Rembrandt, you know, a lot of Rembrandt's paintings were, um, you know, he did a lot of the detail work, but, the, but the, a lot of the prep, like the background stuff was done by his students in his, you know, his atelier, in his, uh, his studio. If, if the Reed case had been around then, all of those students and their estates could sue for a piece of Rembrandt's paintings. Uh, because they contributed to the final artwork. Back in the 1600s, we didn't have laws like this, but now we do. So just keep that in mind. You know, learn what you can deduct and what you can't. This is a wonderful site, by the way, freelancetaxation.com. Uh, I'm a very big fan of this site. Uh, this is basically a list of tax deductions, and it's broken down by art type. So, for example, if you're a sculptor, there's a page called Sculptors, and it gives you examples of all the stuff you can deduct. If you're a writer, uh, it gives you examples of all the things those people can deduct. It's actually broken down by artistic type. They give you lists, they give you suggestions for all kinds of things that you can deduct. Now, of course, you should talk to a lawyer or an accountant before you start taking deductions. <laughs> but this is actually a very, very good site, especially for artists and creative types. I'm a very big fan of this site, and I have no interest in it whatsoever, full disclosure. Last but not least, can you take the new 20% deduction on qualifying business income? The answer is maybe, possibly, but it's very complicated. Uh, the rules, they made this extremely difficult. Uh, and the answer is you probably, most of you will probably not be able to take the deduction because when they define small business for purposes of this deduction, they specifically excluded people in the creative arts whose uh, income is derived primarily from their own efforts. So if you are uh, an owner of an LLC and your work accounts for 90% of, of the income of that LLC, you will not be able to take the 20% deduction. By the way, lawyers can't either, or accountants. So we're in the same club here. 
Uh, for some reason, architects and engineers can. They're the only exception. If you're an architect, you can take that deduction because their lobby was very powerful and got that uh, included in the law when the law was passed. But most other creative types will not be able to take the deduction. So keeping lawsuits at bay, okay? Okay, now let's, let's talk about the flip side, okay? Now we're not talking about you as the artist. We're talking about you, you're creating a work of art and you wanna use somebody else's stuff. What are the rules on that, okay? If you infringe somebody else's copyright, if you take somebody else's work, copyrighted work and you publish it yourself and you, you include it in another work, okay, you are infringing that copyright and they can sue you, they can make you stop, they can make you remove that from the website, from the product. So don't steal other people's stuff. That's rule number one, okay? You're gonna have to learn some rules here. Uh, you're gonna have to learn the rules for mashups, fan fictions, parodies. You ever see these books, by the way? Uh, they're called fan fiction. Uh, they're based on an existing work, but they take the plot lines in new, diff in different directions. So, for example, they'll do a Star Trek thing where Kirk and Spock are, are having an affair with each other, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, there's a lot of that stuff that goes on in the literary world, especially, and there are some very specific rules about these things. I just want to talk about two cases really quickly to give you a sense of, of how complicated this can be. Um, you all know Gone with the Wind, right? The novel by Margaret Mitchell about, you know, life in the pre-Civil War South, right? Well, around the year 2000, um, a young uh, African-American lady decided that she was going to write a book that was based on the Gone with the Wind story, but told from the perspective of an African-American slave on the Tara plantation. Not the one that was played by Butterfly McQueen in the movie, but an entirely different slave who was not a part of the, of the book and basically showing you sort of the, the, the view from the slaves' quarters of what that story must have looked like, you know, to them. And she was very careful. She did not, uh, she did use some of the scenes from the novel, but she did not use any of Margaret Mitchell's words. She didn't, uh, you know, du duplicate any of the dialogue. I mean, Rhett Butler and Scarlett O'Hara were in there, but they all were saying new things that they never said in the original book. And she called the book The Wind Done Gone. Okay? Uh, so Random House published that in 2000. Margaret Mitchell's estate sued. It went all the way up to the uh, the federal court in New York City, and the court basically said, they sided with the publishing house. They said that because the author did not copy any of Margaret Mitchell's words or didn't use, uh, didn't use the same character traits, this was, this, was the, this was the Gone with the Wind story as told by a different cast of characters. It was an entirely separate work, and therefore it stood on its own as a copyrighted work. It was not a derivative work of Gone with the Wind. All right, now that was one case. About six months later, that same court, the Federal uh, Appeals Court in New York, had to hear a very similar case. A Swedish gentleman, guy in Sweden, decided he was a big fan of the novel Catcher in the Rye by J.D. Salinger. Did you ever have to read Catcher in the Rye in high school? Wasn't that awful? But did you? I mean, seriously, I hated that boy. I mean, seriously, that was like one, that and, and the, the two things that you had to read if you were in high school, you know, in English at that time, you had to read Catcher in the Rye and you had to read uh, Death of a Salesman by Arthur Miller, which is also a depressing work of art. Um, but but J.D. Salzer, Catcher in the Rye, I hated Holden Caulfield. I thought he was the biggest jackass I'd ever known in my life, I've ever read about in my life. I don't know why they thought this book was so great. Anyway, but the Swedish guy was a fan of, of Catcher. And what he would have decided is he was going to write a book showing what Holden Caulfield would be like at the age of 60. Okay, figuring, you know, I'm figuring if he was born around 1930, you know, he would have been around 60, 65 at that time. So he decided to write a book about baby Holden Caulfield as a baby boomer geezer. OK, and I don't remember what he called the book. I should have really written down the title, but he didn't use Catcher in the Rye. But here he actually used the Holden Caulfield character. He had him say a lot of the things he referred back to actual scenes and events in the novel, in the in the original novel. Um, you know, he basically did an update of Catcher in the Rye. OK, that book was released in the United States. Uh, J.D. Salinger's estate sued, went all the way up to the same court, only six months after the Wind Gong case. And this time, the court flip-flopped. They said, you know what? This is a derivative work. J.D. Salinger has every right to shut this down because uh, this Swedish author used exactly the same characters, exactly the same plot lines. He refers back to the original. He uses, he quotes dialogue from the original no novel without permission. You know, this is a derivative work. And Salinger's estate did not want royalties. Salinger's estate wanted the work suppressed. They wanted the work banned in the States, and the court went along with that. 
they banned the publication of the English translation of this book. If you want to get a copy of this book in the English language, you must go to England or some other English-speaking country. You cannot get this book legally in the United States. The courts very rarely do that, you know, but in this case, Salinger, you know, he just, he just did not want this book. His estate did not want this book published, and the court went along with it. Avoid basing characters on real-life figures, especially rich ones who can afford to sue you. Okay, simple common sense. I, I love the way, there are some authors, by the way, who do this right. J.K. Rowling, the author of the Harry Potter books, she actually has a section on her website at jkrowling.com where she actually has rules for fan fiction writers. She actually, you know, helps you. She actually says, look, well, I know people are doing Harry Potter fan fiction. I don't have a problem with it, but here are the limits. You can't go beyond, you can't have this character doing that, you can't have this character doing that. She actually gives you a sense of what to stay away from. As long as you stay away from those things, you know, she's okay with you doing fan fiction. The better, you know, more progressive authors will let you do this, but there are some that will not let you do uh, fan fiction of any kind. Disney. Do not try to touch a Disney character. You know, don't try to do the sequel to Frozen. They will not go for that. Okay. So here are my key points. Okay. Great art and business success are not incompatible. You can be a starving artist if you want to, but why? With a little bit of effort, you can be not only a great artist, but a successful one as well. Give your customers what they want and create only what sells. Don't get me wrong. Throw, don't be a hack. Throw your genius into it. Whenever someone gives you a project, put your genius into it. Most of the books that I have written, by the way, I did not dream up myself. My publisher came, my publishers or other people I knew in the legal community came to me and said, Cliff, you know, nobody's ever done a book on X. It would really be a great, if, if there were a book on X, could you give that some thought? So the idea in many cases was not original. You know, people just gave me the idea, but I threw my my, I gave it my best shot. I gave, I gave it my best shot. I threw my time, my effort, and whatever genius I possess into that. And these books all will do very, very well. Almost all of my books are still in print after, in some cases, after, you know, 30 some odd years. So I'm very happy about that. These are not household words. Uh, I would gladly trade all of my royalty statements for just one of Stephen King's. I would be happy with that. Trust me, I would be happy with that. I am not a best-selling, you know, New York Times author by any means, but my books do okay. And there are a lot of authors that do that. They have what they call long tail type books where the books don't sell a lot, but they sell consistently over a long period of time. I mean, some of my books have been in print for 35 years. That, that does generate a fairly predictable revenue stream. That's not a failure by any stretch of the imagination. Build a recognizable brand image. Keep control of your copyrights at all costs. I can't stress that more enough. Whatever happens to the actual works, make sure you protect your copyright, keep it, and enforce it, because that's what's gonna make you rich over the long term. Last but not least, don't steal other people's stuff or base characters on real life people, and especially people who are a lot bigger, more powerful than you, and who can shut you down with just one lawsuit. Um, that, can, that, can really, that can really just ruin your entire career at that point. Be conservative. Again, copyright only protects original works of authorship. The key emphasis here is on the word original. Make sure that everything you do is truly something that comes out of your head, even though it may have been commissioned by somebody, you know, who doesn't look at the world the same way that you do. So that's, that's really all I have to say about the business side of running an artistic business. These are some of my, my best sellers here. The Small Business Survival Guide is a collection of uh, just very cool stories. Uh, I write a syndicated column for Creators Syndicate in Los Angeles. It's called Succeeding in Your Business. And this is just a collection of some of my best columns. They're great stories. Uh, it's a great bathroom read. It's some of the some more inspiring and frankly horrific things that I've seen my clients do in the course of, of 30 plus years of practicing law. And um, this is a book that's specifically for people who sell on eBay. Uh, it's a tax and legal guide for people who sell online. A lot of Amazon sellers too buy this book. Uh, I talk specifically about what tax and legal rules you have to worry about when you're selling things at retail on any of the uh, popular sites like eBay, Amazon, Etsy, and those sorts of things. And I do have sections in there that talk about artistic works and copyright too. There's a section in there about that. And that's basically it, folks. You've been very patient. First of all, thank you very much um, for, for, for holding down your excitement and curbing your enthusiasm in, in, uh, in light of our video uh, presentation tonight. Um, so without any further ado, let me thank all of you uh, for your time in coming out tonight. And now let's get some, now it's your part of the show. Let me try to answer your questions uh, as, as best I can. Thank you very much.